Hello and welcome to Heilman and Haber, the stage and screen podcast coming to you from Casa de Quinn and 1111 Studios in beautiful Port Orchard, Washington. I'm Greg Heilman. And I'm Matt Haver. We're two local actors looking to hone our craft by exploring the best in local theater and on the big screen. Each week we bring you entertainment news and views, celebrate classic Hollywood, enjoy cocktails with a Tinseltown twist, interview talented local actors and directors, and chat with industry experts from L.A. to the U.K. Today is August 20th, and we are glad to be back after two weeks off enjoying a beautiful Pacific Northwest summer. And we're excited to be joined by a special guest for episode 40, actress, producer, TV spokesperson, and author, Kathy Garver. Kathy's most fondly remembered for her starring role as Sissy in the long-running CBS hit Family Affair, and she joins us in a few minutes to talk about her latest projects and experiences in film, theater, radio, voiceover animation, audiobook narration, and more, so stay tuned. And even though we've been on vacation, it's been a busy two weeks for Heilman and Haver. Thanks to everyone who came out to the West Sound Film Festival. It was great to see the local arts community coming out to the historic Roxy Theater to support filmmakers from our area and all over the U.S. and the world. Now, there's nothing better than getting together with friends for a film. And we hope you'll join us at the Roxy tomorrow, Saturday, August 21st, for Movies of the Decade. This month, we're celebrating the 1980s with E.T., the extraterrestrial. That's right. Steven Spielberg's four-time Oscar winner from 1982, starring the adorable Drew Barrymore, hits the Roxy big screen at 6.30 with a special intro from our friend TMC's Jeremy Arnold. We'll see you there. And this week, we also return to the Bay Street Bistro for a new episode of In the Mix. August 17th, we celebrated the birthday of the young Don Vito Corleone himself, Robert De Niro, with a trio of cocktails celebrating the epic Godfather trilogy. Find the video on our YouTube channel and call the Bistro now for reservations for this week's Sunday Supper, featuring a menu fit for a Don. Salute! And cheers to the cast and crew of A Perfect Match at Western Washington Center for the Arts here in Port Orchard. And cheers to everyone who came out to support local theater in Kidsap. Next up is Pirates of Penzance, opening September 10th. And for those of you itching to get back on stage, come out to WWCA at 10 a.m. tomorrow, Saturday the 21st, for auditions for Love Letters by A.R. Gurney, opening in October. And today marks another opportunity to enjoy the talents of our local theater community. As all of you know by now, this podcast resulted in part from being quarantined and looking for a creative way to spend our downtime. Another local group that had the same idea is Virtual Theater 2020. Don't miss their brand new musical Pride and Prejudice, written, produced by founder and a previous guest on our podcast, Amy Knickerbocker. As Amy put it on her Facebook page, 12 months, 11 songs cut down to 9, 95 pages of libretto, a grueling casting process narrowing 65 auditioners down to 18 cast members, 8 weeks of rehearsal equals a full-length virtual musical. Don't miss it. Pride and Prejudice is free to stream on Facebook Watch and will be available live for three performances today, Friday the 20th of August, and tomorrow, August 21st at 6 p.m. Pacific Time and August 22nd at 3 p.m. Pacific Time. Tune in on their Facebook page, at vtheater2020, also linked in our show notes. And now we're pleased to welcome a special guest for episode 40. Most fondly remembered for her starring role as Sissy in the long-running CBS hit Family Affair, Kathy Garver has garnered critical acclaim in movies, stage, radio, voiceover animation, and audiobook narration. Legendary director Cecil B. DeMille was one of the first to recognize Kathy's talents. Originally hired for a small part in the epic motion picture The Ten Commandments, starring Charlton Heston, Kathy was noticed by the great director who had special scenes written into the movie to highlight her. During her teenage years, Kathy added radio and stage to her burgeoning film and television career and was a freshman majoring in speech at UCLA when she was cast in Family Affair to star as Sissy alongside Brian Keith and Sebastian Cabot. One of the warmest and most enduring series of the 1960s and 70s, Family Affair earned Kathy a host of accolades such as Best Actress from the Family Television Awards and it continues to be popular today and is available currently on Amazon Prime. Today, Kathy is an active, accomplished, and versatile actress, appearing in such films as Sweet November and The Princess Diaries, and she's also very much in demand for her numerous vocal characterizations, uh, best known as Firestar, the mutant superhero in Spider-Man and his Amazing Friends TV series. Kathy has also recorded audiobooks for Brilliance Audio, Dove, Listen and Live, and her voice has been heard in Apollo 13, which was awarded the Academy Award for Sound, Ransom, Backdraft, and Jingle All the Way, directed by Ron Howard. Kathy also added author to her long list of accomplishments. Her first book, The Family Affair Cookbook, was a tasty trip down memory lane, and her 2015 memoir, Surviving Sissy, My Family Affair of Life in Hollywood, was just released in paperback. This year, Kathy has two more books scheduled for publication, TV dinners with a side dish of stars, and to celebrate the 55th anniversary of Family Affair, Family Affair, a pictorial scrapbook, will be released in September. 
Currently, Kathy can be seen on her YouTube channel, Cooking Show Cooking with Kathy and Scott, and she'll soon be launching a podcast called All Things Classic with director, writer, and producer John Norton. She's a regular at comic conventions and autograph shows where she greets her many fans. Kathy joins us from her home in Bell Canyon, California. Kathy, welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Greg. Nice to see you, Matt. Yeah, we're so glad you could join us. Yeah, definitely. So, Kathy, your big break came at uh, age nine when you were noticed by none other than the great Cecil B. DeMille. Uh, But you'd already been acting for three years at that time when he discovered you. And something we like to ask all our guests, but I'm really interested to hear your response because you've got an earlier start than probably any of our other guests have gotten. Um, you've done so much over the years and got started so early. What got you started in acting? How did that happen? Well, I'd have to say my parents, since I started acting per se, when I was three years old, and that was at the Meglin Studios. And that was in Hollywood, where they had discovered Shirley Temple. And of course, my mother being the proud mother that all mothers are, said, oh, yes, well, my daughter is the, the next Shirley Temple. So she um, engaged me and signed me up for singing and dancing lessons. And so it was so natural to me. It was like I had always been an actress. So the only impetus was my mother thinking that, of course, she has a wonderful, talented child and that she is going to do very well. And we will encourage her in this endeavor. But it certainly was a conscious decision because it was just an innate thing that I had started doing when I was three years old. Just kind of a continuation of what you've been, almost a natural progression, right? Exactly. Sounds like, yeah. Sure. And then, you know, it was interesting when I was in college and or, you know, trying to establish my identity as all teenagers do and young people do. I said, well, who am I? Why am I here? What am I supposed to do? And I said, well, what am I supposed to do? And I had been an actor uh, all my life. And so I said, well... When I went to college, I said, well, I'm an actor, so what else could I do? And my lovely mother, who had pushed me, not pushed me, but introduced me into the entertainment business, says, well, I think that perhaps you should major in something that isn't theater arts or or film. So I got a liberal arts degree in speech and psychology, just in (laughs) case I didn't make it as an actress. Oh, thank you, Mom. (laughs) I think a liberal arts education is something I think that it, it goes undervalued in, in society. So I, I've got a liberal, liberal arts degree. It introduced me to a ton of things that I would have never been introduced to otherwise. I know that Bob Iger, who is the former CEO of Disney, liberal arts degree, same thing. It gives you a kind of a well-rounded education. Did you find when you did that, that you got interested in anything that you wouldn't have otherwise? I agree with you 100%. And... Um... I have a son and as old as I am, my son is 30. And when he was a baby too, I tried to introduce him to many, many different things. And a liberal arts degree, I found, I have found incredibly useful in life. A, because you can talk to anybody. It Mm -hmm. it gives you a greater understanding. And I went to UCLA and that's where I graduated and I got a master's there, but their undergraduate uh, curriculum is like sociology and psychology. Mm -hmm. So you understand the social things. It's science, it's arts. And I actually started out in anthropology because, you know, again, the young person saying, well, who am I and why am I here? And understanding the evolution and, you know, what is the world and, you know, the philosophy. So I think it just guides you and is really a wonderful thing that you can call on and especially in the like little trivia questions that they ask on AOL now, and you can play like the trivia game. And you can, you're much better and you get like 68%, you know, <laughs> agree with you instead of two. So yes, I, I, I agree. I think it's a, it's a wonderful way to go. Cecil B. DeMille, uh, none other than the great director himself. He, uh, he wrote scenes for you, including one I was reading another interview uh, with you. Uh, where you describe a scene that was actually cut from the original film of the Ten Commandments, where Charlton Heston uh, interacts with you and ends up picking you up and carrying you across the the Red Sea as the waters part. You were extremely young at the time. Did you get a sense that this was something big, that that this film was going to be as big as it was at that time? Or was this just kind of another job for you at that point? Well, as as you have said, I was nine years old. And so what does a nine-year-old know? 
a nine-year-old and a child really, in my estimation, primarily operates from, from senses, from, you know, eyes and nose and, and hearing and, and tasting. And they're, they're a very natural kind of little animal that is just absorbing things. They don't see the big picture. I did not see the big picture. What I did see was the stable that was on Paramount where we were shooting a lot of the scenes from the Ten Commandments where Donkey was having a baby. Whoa, that's <laughs> exciting. And they had donkeys and, and, and oxen and camels, oh my. And they had all these animals. So I got a sense of that and the smell of that. When I was on the paper mache mountain, when the Red Sea was closing and the water was splashing in my face, I have sensual memories of that when this great big figure, you know, was so awesome coming up in these, these robes with stripes and saying, are you all right? Are you afraid? He says to me. And I said, no, but my doll Rebecca is. I remember those lines and, and being scooped up by this big presence and this big person taking me away from something that I had sensed was danger. That's the way a kid operates. Is that scene available in any kind of an extended cut that has been released after the fact? Do they offer that type of thing? I mean, what, for films that were made that long ago, or did that type of stuff end up on the cutting room floor and that was it? No, as a matter of fact, they do. Now, what is extant in, in the film was at the beginning, uh, where Cecil B. DeMille had written other scenes for me, and it's at the start of the exodus, and the camera starts on me as this little girl, Rachel, and I'm walking downstairs. And I said, Grandfather, do you have the pumpkin? And he said, and then I said, where's Rebecca? And then this disembodied hand comes out and said, here's Rebecca. And Rebecca was a doll. And then I take the doll and I say, thank you. And the camera follows me down over to a well where I'm trying to get water for the long journey and the other people are trying to get water. That was the setup scene for the one with Charlton Heston, where he says, are you afraid? And I said, no, but Rebecca is, uh -huh. which was my doll. Now I have seen, you know, maybe twice, of course, one can almost find anything on Google, but, um, and they did have the uncut version, but I have not ever seen, you know, that particular cut. But if any of your listeners, or if you, <laughs> you mad and Greg would like to do a little research, I will be forever beholden. I think we have some homework. I think so. I think we do. <laughs> well, speaking of homework, and you, and you mentioned earlier about your days in, at UCLA, uh, you spent time in theater and radio during your teenage years and then studied speech at UCLA, among the other things that we kind of talked about before. But how did your education and working in those two mediums, radio and, and theater, kind of inform or prepare you for your TV career, which I think many would say you're most known for? Well, actually, after the Ten Commandments, I worked in film and TV and in radio. But again, as a child, you use your natural ability. And one of the books that I've written out of five is Ex-Child Stars. Where are they now? We might talk about that later. But a child is thought to be a really good actor if they can say their lines, act natural, and hit their marks. But what that teaches a child is that they just have to be natural. And so many of the actors that have failed to make the transition from a child actor to an adult actor is that they still just try and be themselves. You take some of the better child stars like Jodie Foster or Brooke Shields or, you know, that went to Harvard or Yale and actually studied acting, what a concept then you see that they are able to create a character and analyze a scene. Whereas the ego comes with a lot of the child stars. They say, well, I've done a TV series. Oh, I was the star of a movie. And they don't think that they need to know and to learn about acting. So going back to your you know, original question, Greg, is that any experience I think that one has, whether they're a child, you know, and just absorbing through the senses or, or going on to a different field, puts to what they are today and, and what they can accomplish. I taught, I taught voiceover for like 20 years, and I told my voiceover students, you know, don't just think that you're going to 
uh, the, I said, oh, well, my, my best thing is a narrator. I can really narrate industrious. So I says, well, that's nice, you know, and, and that would, would be good to focus on. However, if you want to make a career and make money, again, what a concept in the entertainment field, you know, put out your tentacles and be able to embrace all the different fields that exist in the voiceover realm. So you're a narrator. Okay, great. Learn how to do character voices. Learn how to do commercials. Learn how to do the different elements of commercial. Are you a spokesperson? Are you a character? Are you a real person? Learn how to do ADR and learn how to do audiobooks. I've done 80 audiobooks. And that's why, as old as I am, I'm still in the business and, and flourishing, I, I say, and I say proudly, uh, because I'm old and I can say that now. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to go back to your your comment about child actors. Uh, we're involved at the historic Roxy Theater up here in Bremerton, and uh, this Saturday, the 21st, they're going to be showing E.T. on the big screen uh, with, of course, Drew Barrymore, a tiny little adorable Drew Barrymore. And you see some of these child actors, and it, it makes you wonder how much of this is natural versus how much, again, as a Barrymore, perhaps she had some coaching at a young age, but did you have a coach? Did you have someone that helped you with... Uh, dialect? Did you have someone that, that was teaching you things even at that young age, or were you just kind of a natural? Well, as I said, I started out at three years old with at the Meglin Studios, and she was the premier, really, teacher of young children. It was primarily singing and dancing, but she also had singing coaches there and dramatic coaches. So from such an early age, I learned how, as a child, to do the various aspects of the entertainment world. And so that helped a lot. Yes, I think there is some natural talent. I, I do believe that. And if you don't have it, you know, you, you can be lucky, you can do some particular things, but you might not last a long time in the business. Even if you have a great deal of talent and it is recognized and, and you get a lot of work as a child, and then you say, well, why, why am I successful? And what is it that made people still want to keep hiring me? And all the kids go through this very difficult age as all just regular people do from like 13 to 18, which is, very, you know, trying to find your identity and, and who you are. And those that have been stars, child stars, have it even worse because then all of a sudden, you know, they don't have the attention, they don't have the publicity, they don't have people taking care of them, and, and they are lost. So in order to make that jump, and Drew Barrymore was able to do it, and she had innate talent. I agree with you. She probably had some Barrymore genes and DNA. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that, and that, some, that helps a lot. But it doesn't help a lot if you get on drugs or if, or if you're depressed or if you don't have direction. Yeah, I think it's interesting to watch. We watch all the kids from the Harry Potter movies as we watch them grow up. And then the Harry Potter movies end, and then they're, we're watching them try to transition into adult roles and things like that. I wonder, the ones that aren't successful in making that jump or do it with a lot of difficulty, are they the ones that are trying to ride that wave? that You mentioned before, I was in a TV series, so everything's fine. I, you know, I'm, I'm awesome. I think that you're assigning more consciousness and uh, understanding to these still undeveloped brains and personalities. There is not an awareness, I believe, at that particular time of who they are and where they are. There may be a skewed one, but in their own realm, they're just trying to do what they're told when they're children, so people will like them, and so they'll get A's, or their mom and dad will like them, or you know, as they proceed, well, maybe my peers will like me. Well, my peers aren't liking me because I'm not taking drugs like them or I'm doing what I'm told and, and they're not. So I want to be liked. And that becomes more important than, and that was one of the, the things that I think happened to Anissa Jones that was on Family Affair, who unfortunately died at 18 of a drug overdose because she was in a wrong crowd or a, a crowd that was taking drugs and and like her were just trying to find out who they were and, and where they where they are in this life. When you put it that way, it, may, it it's almost a parallel to an athlete who's a teenager, a figure skater, gymnast, 
and you watch them under pressure. And I, as, as a, as a 50 some odd year old think I could never handle that pressure, all those people looking at me. But at that point, and to your point, they're kind of too young to realize that, right? Absolutely. What they're focused on is doing a good job. They have been trained and, uh, you know, they, they have a routine, you know, if they're the ice skater or if they're on baseball, I mean, they're thinking about looking at that ball and hitting it if they are going to be successful. They are, if they're a skier, you know, they're concentrating on that. They don't see the larger picture so much. This is what happens when you're a cycle, you know, a psych <laughs> minor <laughs> and you don't get your master's, you get it in, in theater arts instead. <laughs> Well, let's talk about uh, let's talk about the mind a little bit. Uh, your work on Family Affair earned you uh, many accolades, including uh, Best Actress from the Family Television Awards. And yet, you said in other interviews that uh, filming it was uh, demanded an awful lot of you. And uh, I loved a quote uh, that I read. Uh, you said most of my close-ups were opposite the assistant director, a paunchy middle-aged man glued to a cigar. I had to use a lot of imagination to see him as my six-year-old sister Buffy, who was obviously played by young Miss Jones. Tell us why the power of imagination is so important for an actor. Absolutely. I mean, you, you, here you are on a set and there are cameras and there are lights and there are gaffers and there are people watching over here and their makeup person over here and they've just put it makeup on you. Then all of a sudden, boom, okay, action. Well, hello, you're then into a whole different realm where whether you are being slaughtered by by the Taliban or you are in a romantic situation or you are, are laughing at someone's joke and it's your son or your daughter's having a baby or perhaps you are the dad watching your uh, wife have a baby whatever the situation is you have to focus and that is a lot of your imagination. And I think one of the best things that I learned when I was doing uh, Gil, I think it, I, I was with Guilford in Hellborn or whatever, but it was with Nicole Kidman. And I was on that movie. Well, I saw this absolutely fabulous actress and she is focused. Before she goes on to any scene, she is right there. And whatever she has put into her imagination or that she has built into her, her character that she is going to do or her objective or whatever, which you totally forget once you are, are playing the moment, is that she's focused. And you have to be. I mean, how distracting would that be? And Greg, as you had said, you know, well, if I'm in this situation and, I, you know, how, how do you go up in front of all these people? You forget the people. Or I, I, as I was a speech major in the adage is, oh, you just, you know, look at everybody and they're in their underwear, which I think, <laughs> you know, kind of takes you off where, where you want to be. Where's your presentational self? Where's your heart? Where's your spirit that you want to light other people's life? And I suppose that relaxation goes hand in hand with the focus. Anytime I, I'm reading about acting, you know, listening to something on YouTube, uh, relaxation continues to come up. How did you get into the zone when you were when you found yourself in those moments? How do you still do that? Well, I I heard this one thing on radio, and it doesn't have to do with relaxation, but I'll I'll address that. But what has really helped me, even in the last six months. And you're always learning, you're always picking up different things that, that help you advance and, and, and be as good as you are to let your light shine. But it was a maestro of music and he had a lot of his pianists under him, his students, and they would play the concerts. And he says, don't play like a trained bird. Hmm. Now, I had gone to a Catholic school, uh, when it, you know, earlier, and I had done very well in, in high school, and God bless me with some, some intellect and at, at UCLA, and I read every single thing, and I presented everything exactly right, and I analyzed every single scene, and I did exactly what I was supposed to, so I expected everything to be great, but hello, you're forgetting your heart, you're forgetting your spirit, and you say, okay, yeah, I, I can analyze that. Now forget it. 
don't be a train bird. Be who you are. And the relaxation factor comes from it, I think, from the confidence that you know what you're doing. I think it's absolutely imperative, imperative for me that I, I know all my lines exactly right. And I've analyzed my scene and I've done who, what, where, why, and then. And then I said, okay, now forget it all and don't be a trained bird. You know, make an impression on Matt, make an impression on Greg, make this the best podcast I've ever done. You know, put those little thoughts into your head and then go with it. Yeah, it was interesting. We were a few episodes ago. We interviewed uh, Perry King, and he was uh, he was telling us a story about when he was working with James Mason, and Perry was sitting there with his notebook, and he had his notes, and he was studying stuff before his scene, and he was getting all anxious. and And, and Mr. Mason said, "Take that thing and throw it out." He goes, "You're going to get into the scene. Your instinct's going to take over. You've done your preparation. Don't overthink it." That kind of sounds like what your what what your advice is. Ab- yes, ab- absolutely, because. Then if you say, okay, my objective is to be wonderful. (laughs) (laughs) You say, okay, just forget it. Just, you know, let let your heart and spirit take over for you. You got to trust it. And a glass of wine doesn't help either. (laughs) (laughs) Or two. (laughs) I just did uh, an interview in Palm Springs with some good friends of mine, Paul Belsito and Steve Roach. And it was champagne brunch. And so we were at their, you know, they they did it at their house by the pool with a, a glass of champagne, which is very nice to uh, to give your interviewee. <laughs> God knows what they'll say. It, it's funny how there's a, well, there's a social component to drinking and and food too. We had a Carrie Bible on uh, last time who who does a Hollywood Kitchens, I guess vlog you would call it. It's a video blog. You know, we were talking to her about this, that same thing that how food and food and film kind of go together and it makes it and, and alcohol as well. It's kind of just a social it makes the conversation more. It makes it easier. Well, yes. And that leads me right into my new book, which is coming out, which is TV dinners, TV. And this is my fourth cookbook. I've done uh, cooking. I, I have like two or three cooking shows. One is Cooking with Kathy, and another one is Cooking with Kathy, Scott, and Friends, and then there is Family Tree Recipe, but my most fun one is the one that's coming out as TV Dinners. Uh, It's a cookbook that goes along with a pilot that we have made where we take the classic TV dinners. You guys are probably too young, maybe not. Mm-mm. The metal, the, 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 yeah. the metal, <laughs> the the metal Swanson dinners, yeah. thing. Yep. Yeah, the Swanson things with the with the partitions and the meatloaf and the mashed potatoes and, yep. The yep. and all that. Well, we take that dinner, we make it more healthy, and we have uh, guest stars on, classic stars, that uh, we say, and what? how can we bring you up to date <laughs> and what's happening with you now? But I agree that uh, a little wine goes a long way and food is a very comforting thing. Yeah, I was on your website checking out some of the photos of the TV dinners that you prepare. Much healthier and much more appetizing <laughs> than a lot of the ones I remember from, <laughs> from my childhood. And, and they probably don't taste like metal when you scrape them with your fork. You don't get that metal. Well, you know, it's interesting because back then they put them in the oven. Mm-hmm. And now, as you were saying before, technology, do we love technology? When you put it in the microwave, it's it's a whole different type of thing. And hopefully it's not as skinny. And hopefully it's much better when you substitute cauliflower instead of mashed potatoes and turkey instead of beef and, you know, um, Brussels sprouts instead of peas. Keep moving forward. <laughs> so back to you, back to you and, and your illustrious career. Um, earlier this month, you were in Connecticut appearing at Terrificon, signing comic books and posters of your character, Angelica Jones, Firestar, in Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends, which was a big hit in the 80s and is still available on Disney+. Plus. How did you first break into character voice work? And how does it differ from the other kinds of acting you've done, either from preparation or just from performance? Well, I was with a commercial agent in Hollywood. And one time they called and they said, well, we have an interview for you for voiceover. And I said, what's voiceover? I'd never heard of it before. And so I said, oh, just go on the audition. I said, well, okay. I went on this audition and the fellow says, okay, 
nice to meet you. And we'd like you to say, um, I like Starkist. This is for Tuna, obviously. And so I said, I like Star Starkist. And he says, well, now do it in a different voice. I said, what do you mean a different voice? I said, I like Starkist. No, 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 a different voice. I never knew I had a different voice. So I said, I like Starkist. Oh, okay. Could, could you do a different voice? <laughs> I like Starkist, but I don't think I could even do that then. I never knew that I had different voices within me, even though I knew I was kind of crazy and was maybe schizophrenic, but I didn't know <laughs> I had all those voices inside of me. So I immediately signed up for a voiceover class with Mel Wells, who was just fabulous. And uh, I learned how to do voiceovers and it has really served me well in my career because, you know, as actors, there are you do a fabulous part on a TV and then you don't have any more interviews or it's a down period or you went on four interviews and you didn't get it. Or, so what do you do? You, and again, that's what I, I say to try and know and develop your skills because every different type of thing in the entertainment business requires, in my estimation, a different style. So if you're doing film, you know, you can hardly hear what they're saying. And I'm always turning up you know, this ass. So what did they say? I say to my husband of 40 years, I said, what did they say? So I'm up to 44 <laughs> on the, the volume. Hey, what did they say? Because they're talking like this and, and, the, and the microphone's picking them up. TV and you're doing a sitcom, you can be a little louder. When you're doing stage, you've got to be big or nobody sees you. Voiceover is, is wonderful because uh, you convey everything in, in your voice and you have to, you're conveying the character, the emotion, the attitude, everything. Like, I'm really liking you guys. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and I'm just 12 and I always talk up. That's the way I end my sentences. Or there's sexy or there's, there's dialects and uh, audiobooks takes a whole different kind of thing because you're a narrator and then you have to have maybe a hundred different kinds of voices when you are narrating a, a fiction book. So all of these different kinds of opportunities that are available in the entertainment world for an actor means developing the different skills. And then the big thing is marketing yourself in those particular areas. Well, thank you again to our guest, Kathy Garver. Join us next week for the second half of our interview with Kathy, and you can find out more about her and order copies of her books and keep up on all of her latest projects at kathygarver.com, linked in the show notes. And if you enjoy the show, make sure to follow us and share the podcast with a friend or two. Tell them to visit heilmanandhaver.com and tune in on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Amazon Audible, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Pandora. Drop us a message on Facebook and Twitter, and as always, thank you wherever you are for supporting local theater and for joining us on Heilman and Haver. 